<laughs> I like that one. Well, today I'm going to share the first part of a message on preparing for the future. What kind of things do we do to prepare for the future? You ever thought about that? I wrote some things you might do to prepare for the future. You might save money for something important, like college or for presents or for something that you've been waiting for. You might get an education to prepare for the future, get a degree, go to school. You might stock up. Now, I'm not talking about preparing for the apocalypse or Y2K or anything. How many remember Y2K and how people went crazy? Yeah, a little overboard. Uh, you could take care of the environment so that future generations have the beauty that you've grown up with to be there. You can plan ahead, things like making goals or becoming the best version of yourself. Probably the most important thing you can do to plan for the future, and this is the future beyond this world, is to get your life right with God. Because eternal life is guaranteed for those who put their faith in Jesus. That's the best thing you can do to plan for the future. You see, a life with God guarantees us not only a future in heaven, though, there's also some benefits on this earth, a lot of benefits. It gives us a relationship with him. Literally, here's, here's, here should blow our minds away if you think about it. A relationship with the God of the universe is something he offers. And he helps us to navigate what to do for the rest of our lives. Today we're going to look at some of the things that God led his people to do to prepare for the future as they were getting ready to enter into the promised land. I did come across a few future jokes. Here you go. One person said, I'm well prepared for a cashless society. Having kids already has me there. <laughs> Another person said, I can predict the score of the Super Bowl before it starts. Zero, zero. <laughs> it is before it starts. One person said it this way, I'm a little worried about the future of the sport of Olympic skiing. It's going downhill fast. <laughs> Sorry, those are bad. <laughs> the children of Israel were getting ready to go into the promised land. Let me get back to the Bible out of that. And there were some lessons they learned. As we get into 2024 and we prepare for what God has for us in store, uh, the theme that God has placed on my heart for this year is making the most of every opportunity. And I'm going to get into that more and more over the next few weeks. But before you can make the most of every opportunity, you need to prepare for the opportunities that are going to be presented to you. You need to prepare mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, whatever way for those opportunities. There's a great story in the Old Testament that can help us as we walk through preparing for the future. It's the, the, the people of Israel, as they had, uh, were getting ready to cross the Jordan River into the, the promised land. It's found in the book of Joshua. If you have your Bible, you can turn. We've also got the Bible verses you can read up here. But we're going to focus on, on the parts of the first three chapters today. I'm not going to read it all to you. I'll give you a little brief recap. Um, a little background. Prior to this passage uh, of Scripture, Moses had just died. They had buried him, and they took some time to mourn their longtime leader and friend um, who had led them from Egypt to where they were at this point. And we know, we know in the scriptures that God did not allow Moses to enter into the promised land because of his disobedience. And now the children of Israel are getting close to the promised land, and Joshua is succeeding Moses. He's their new leader. The people are approaching the edge of the Jordan River, and uh, much of the promised land is on the other side of the Jordan River. And as they say down south, they're fixing to cross the river. And as they're fixing to cross this river, this is where we pick up the story in Joshua chapter 3. As I read, I want you to notice the orders that were given to the people to prepare for the crossing. 
And then I'll explain some of the parts of this. Starting in chapter 3, verse 1, here's what it says. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan. By the way, get that right. It's Shittim, okay? And they went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things things among you. There are several orders that they needed to do here, but before they could do this, they had to prepare for the opportunity. I'm going to get to the orders later, but first we're going to look into the first opportunity to prepare for the future. Second is the preparation that happened before this, and then let's finish off with the actual orders that they needed to follow in order to accomplish what God had for them. So are you ready? Buckle your seatbelts. I know you don't have them there, but you can snap your pretend ones on. And there's a lot here. I'm going to go through some quickly and some a little slow down a little bit. But uh, the first thing I want to talk to today is the first opportunity. And if you have notes, you can fill that in. Their first opportunity to prepare for the future. The opportunity was to cross the Jordan River as they were conquering the promised land. It was a major opportunity for them. It was a landmark. It was an important step that they needed to get to. This opportunity represented many things in their life, things that we can identify with some or all of them today. What were the opportunities before them? It wasn't just the crossing of the river. What did those represent? The first thing was, it was entering into the promises of God. God had promised this land to them. Years before this, God promised Abraham and his descendants some land, which is often referred to in the Bible as the promised land. You can read about it in Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, the first time it was promised. And crossing the Jordan represented a fulfillment of the promise given to Abraham. This was an important thing. It was 470 years earlier that Abraham had been given this promise. And 470 years later, here we are sitting on the cusp of entering into the promise that God had given him. What promises does he have for us today? In Joel and Acts, we read of promises that God gives us. There was a promise that when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost, that that would take place. And he said this, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. The promise began years ago, but we are still seeing the the fulfillment of that today. Do your sons prophesy? Do your daughters prophesy? You see, those are all part of the promise that God gave to us. See, God has promises throughout Scripture. You need to see them, and you need to understand that those promises are still for today. That was the first opportunity, was entering into the promises of God. What else did this represent? Entering into the new things that God has. You remember what he said to them? He said, here's the orders. You're going to go somewhere you've never gone before. The new things that were ahead of them. Here's some of the new things that they were encountering and some of the new things you might encounter. New land. They went from wilderness wanderers to landowners now. That's what their next step would be. They had new leaders. They went from Abraham leading them to now Joshua. Or excuse me, Moses leading them to Joshua. (laughs) New miracles were about to take place. They didn't know it at the time exactly what they were, but they were coming We'll see later that God parted the Jordan River. We'll see that shortly after that, the people marched around a city that had tall, thick walls. And some of you remember what happened when they marched around seven times, seven days. The walls of Jericho came tumbling down. We'll see later after this, when they were in the middle of an army and God stood the sun still for the day. New miracles were about to take place. They didn't understand them all at the time, but they were coming. There was also new blessings and new provision. They were going to stop, as soon as they crossed the river, they were going to stop getting manna provided every single day 
to now picking the fruit of the land. There was new victories. They were going to be conquering the people there. And then there would be new markers and significant events. You'll find out that God told them to set up a marker next to the Jordan River after he did the miracle with them. And here's the thing that stuck with me this last week. There was the new Passover. Did you know there were three Passovers in Scripture? Maybe not the way you think of it. There was the first Passover when they left Egypt, and the angel passed over those who had blood over theirs. The second Passover, at least I call it that way, was when they passed over the Red Sea when God had parted it. And the third Passover is coming right now, the Passover where God was going to pass them over or through the Jordan River to the Promised Land. These are all new things that God had for them. You know, I sometimes wonder if we could see all the things ahead, what we would, how we would react. What new things did God, does God have for you and for me in 2024? I don't know. What things is he preparing us for? You see, crossing the Jordan River represented the new things that were ahead of them. And the third thing I think this represented, the opportunity, was growing as people. These people weren't going to be stuck in the same old ways. You see, here's what I know. When we exercise our faith, it helps us grow in faith as people of God. When you exert your faith, when you put your faith in Jesus, however you want to say it, Here's some people who grew during this time. Joshua grew as a leader when he stepped forward in faith and said, I'm going to lead these people now. We see that the priests grew. As you read the story later, you'll find out that they were told to step into the waters of the Jordan River while carrying the ark. Let me, let me give you a quick background, and then I'm going to show you a video. Think about this for a second. God told the priest to carry the ark of the Lord, and he said, I want you to go into the Jordan River, begin to walk into the water while it's at flood stage, and I'm going to do a miracle. Now, I want to show you a picture of what this might look like. Have you ever been around a river that had flood waters? This is what it looks like. Imagine waters coming down the river like that, and you're carrying a bunch of things, and God says, I just want you to start walking in that water. Have you ever been in really fast-moving water? What tends to happen? You get washed down with it. And he said, I want you to dip your foot and start walking into that water and watch what happens. That took a little out, lot of faith, don't you think? To say, okay, God's going to do something. What happens if I'm the guy in the front? See, you know, I'm volunteering. Hey, I'll be the guy in the back of the ark, and I'll see what the front guys do, Right? And they said, okay, God, we're going to believe in faith that you're still going to do something. And they began to exercise that faith. And then we see later that the people showed their faith when they were obedient to what God asked them to do as they were preparing. And we'll talk in a minute about what they needed to do to prepare. But they had to show growth as people to say, you know what, I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Which leads me into my second point, the preparation. What was the preparation that they had to do? What was God asking them to do? You see, for every opportunity, there's often preparation that goes into it. What was the preparation here? Well, the first thing that God asked them to do was, to pre was preparing provisions for the, for the trip ahead. They prepared provisions. Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 10, says this. So Joshua ordered the officers of the people, go through the camp and tell the people, get your provisions ready. Three days from now you will cross the Jordan here to go in and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you for your own. They needed to prepare for the next move and all that it entailed. This wasn't preparing for Y2K. This wasn't pre preparing for the apocalypse. This was preparing for crossing the Jordan River. They needed the food because, well, now right now they could only store up food for one day. That's the way God ordered manna. But they could get everything else ready. They could start uh, packing up their tents. They could start getting everything ready for the next move that was coming up. Maybe they could get fruit and grain for their animals. Maybe they needed to do some things with their clothes. Maybe it was like the old Western people when they were preparing to go on the Oregon Trail. They had to get everything packed up and ready to go so that they could get their provisions ready for the trip. Sometimes we need 
prepare provisions for where God is taking us. Where is God taking you? Where is the future taking you? A little, a little savings maybe? A little maintenance done on our supplies? Maybe your preparation is a little food or, or catching up on projects that you put off for far too long? You know what I think is interesting? Here's what I've noticed in human nature. Most people say, we're going to get that project done whenever. And you know when it usually gets done? When you go to sell your house, you do all the projects that need to be done, and then you don't get to enjoy them. How many have been there, done that? (laughs) Why not prepare for what's ahead, and you get to enjoy it? We need to get our provisions ready. If God decided or told you that something was coming up ahead... Is your house or your provisions ready? Good question. The second thing he asked them to do was he he came to prepare the people to follow. They needed to follow the leader. They had to to come up before they could actually follow. They had to decide that they were going to follow. Now, here's an interesting passage and how this plays out. In Joshua chapter 1, starting in verse 16. Then they answered Joshua, this is the people, Whatever you have commanded us, we will do, and wherever you send us, we will go. Just as we fully obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. Now, let me stop there for a second. They're saying, before you give us the orders, we are vowing, we are telling you that we are prepared to follow you. Now, listen to how extreme it got, though. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Whoever rebels against your word and does not obey your words, whatever you may command them, we will put to death. Only be strong and courageous. So here's some of the preparations. They prepared their hearts and minds to walk in obedience. They even voiced it out loud to the people and to Joshua. They assured the leadership that they would follow. We're in Joshua. They even provided, shall we call it, positive or assertive peer pressure. If you don't, you're going to die. Now, that's a little extreme. We don't normally advocate for that nowadays. But they were so serious about entering the promised land that they wanted to make sure that everybody was on board. Now, I'm not saying you have to threaten somebody's life, but sometimes you need to be firm and say, this is where we are going. If you're not in, you're going to get left behind. We are in. We are preparing ourselves for where God is taking us. And then, I thought it was interesting at the end, they said to Joshua at the end, only be strong and courageous. They encouraged the leader. Sometimes leaders need some positive words of affirmation and a little uplifting too. Think about that as you move forward. As we prepare for 2024, people need to know that you are on board and that you are in the journey that God has for you and for them And us as a church, we need to know that you're on board. Are you prepared in your heart and your mind to move forward for what God has in 2024? The last, or the next thing that he had them do, I think there's two more, was plotting the course ahead. That was part of the preparation. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, and this is where I'm skipping through the story, says, then Joshua, son of Nun, he didn't have a father, he was son of Nun, sorry, just kidding, (laughs) <laughs> that was his dad's name. That wouldn't go over very well today, would it? If you said, I'm a son of a nun, they'd say, I thought well, nuns don't get married. Sorry, I'm getting way off track here. Joshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shatim. Go look over the land, he said, especially Jericho. So they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there in Jericho. So these spies went out to plot the course that was ahead of them. Sometimes we need to get the lay of the land before we jump right in. God wanted them to see what was on the other side of the river, and he wanted them to see what was a couple of steps in front of them before they took those next steps as a a people. How many of you here like to plan things ahead? Any of you here are planners? Some of you are like, I just go with the flow. That's okay, somebody else can plan. You want to test the soil, those of you who are planners, before you put your foot down so you don't get stuck in the mud, right? God often lets us see just far enough ahead of us so that we can take the next step. Sometimes I wish, 
I wish I could see between here and like a mile down the road. And he says, no, I just want you to know the next step. Here what he's doing, he's saying, I'm letting you know just across the river over there. I've actually been to that place. You can look over, and you can see the river there, and then Jer- Jericho's just a little ways further, half a mile away or so. There it is. I just want you to go in there just far enough and see what's going on, what the next step is. That's your plan. Plot the course just to the next step. And then the last step is this, to move in, in moving in close proximity. I use the, all the words that start with the letter P. That's why I use proximity. As we read earlier, the people moved right to the boundary of the Jordan River. You see, you can't cross the Jordan River until you get next to it. <laughs> Pretty simple, right? You can't get to step two until you step, finish step one. Joshua chapter 3, verse 1, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. My dad jokes when we do a large project like a roof on a house, we get to the last few pieces left. He goes, that's the last ones. Why didn't we do those first? We'd be done already. Well, that way, I wish it would work that way, right? But you have to do all the steps beforehand to get the last steps done. You can't skip ahead. The Israelites had to make it to the banks of the Jordan River before they could cross the river and enter the promises of God. They had to move in close proximity. You see, you can't go to step two until you finish step one. You can't take advantage of the opportunity until you prepare for the opportunity sometimes. Sometimes we need to get close before we can make take the next step in our lives. Sometimes it's just a small step of obedience. Sometimes it's selling off something we don't need anymore. Sometimes it's knocking on a door and seeing what happens. Sometimes we need to get in close proximity before we can actually cross the threshold. Sometimes you have to get you have to get to the fork in the road before you can take the right path. Or step in faith for that opportunity. See, there are preparations that need to be made. And then here's the exciting part. After you make those preparations, then God usually gives us some orders to get ready to enter into our promised land, whatever that opportunity is. Here's the orders. And let me, I read them earlier, but there was at least four orders that I found there. He said, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, this is starting in chapter verse 3, he says, and the priests who are Levites carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. The first order is to move out. Where are we to move out of? Where are they to move out of? From their positions. What positions were they in? Let me suggest a few positions they may have been in and maybe that we are in. Their comfort zone, your comfort zone. We've been camping here a while. It feels real nice. Or how about, I call it your sedimentary spot or your spot where you get stuck in a rut or in the mud or set in stone. Sometimes we can say, you know what, this place is so comfortable that I'm going to stay here forever. I remember our daughter, Brianna, when she was nine or ten years old, and she came to, I think, Christy crying. She goes, I don't want to get any older. I like the age I am now. (laughs) It's comfortable. It's nice. Where else where we need to move out of? Your camp. What is your camp? I don't know what your camp is. Could it be your family? Could it be your situation? You've camped out in some place and you don't want to move? Could that be your house or your dwelling place? I've lived here since I've been so-and-so or such-and-such age or I like where I live. What happens if God says, I want you to move to a different house or a different town or a different place or a different situation. You see, sometimes 
God says it's time to move out. Let me give you a little word of advice that I learned in my life, and maybe it will help you. Usually, when it's time to move, God makes you uncomfortable from where you're at. It's like you have grace to live in that situation. Let me give you an example. Before I moved here, I worked for the state of Montana for four years. I actually loved my job. I enjoyed a lot of parts of it. And then all of a sudden, the last few months, everything that I loved about my job was starting to get on my nerves. You know why? Because God was stirring me up that it was time to jump out of the nest, so to speak, and move on. And that's when God moved us here to become your pastors. Many times God tells us it's time to move out. He will get you uncomfortable where you're at so that you're willing to move to the next step, whatever that is. Now, I'm not saying it's always moving into a new location. Maybe it's just getting out of your rut. And then he said after that, move out. And then he says, from your positions and follow it. The next order is to follow. Who should they follow? First of all, there's, he said, I want to need you to follow the leaders that God places in, your, in our life. Who are the leaders that God placed it, places in your life? For them, it was Joshua and those who were over them. Who were your leaders? Is it your parents? Is it your boss? Is it your spouse? Is it your pastor? Is it the community leaders that are around you? You know, sometimes we think we know better, but sometimes we need to listen and obey the leaders that God places over us. And then he said, not only follow the leaders, the Levites and Joshua, but follow, he said, the ark of God. What does the ark of God represent? Some of you already know this. It represented the presence of God. There's a song we used to sing, Where He Leads, I'll Follow. Where is the presence of God leading you? You see, you don't want to go somewhere God is not leading. You don't want to go anywhere where the presence of God is not there. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him. And what does it say at the end? And He will direct your path. He will make your path straight, another scripture says. There's an old saying that's been borrowed and changed for years. I think Billy Graham said it this way, God will not lead us where the grace of God cannot keep us or sustain us. We need to follow the presence of God ahead of us, which leads to my third point, an order that he gave the children of Israel here. In Joshua chapter 3, verse 4, he says, But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Here's what my application of it is. Don't get ahead of God. God told them to keep a distance. Sometimes we rush ahead of God because we are impatient or stubborn and we think maybe we know a better way. Or we think that God is taking too long. But God told the Israelites to stand behind the ark of the Lord and the priests, a total of 2,000 cubits. Now, I don't know if you know what a cubit is, but a cubit is about a foot and a half. So he was telling them to go about 3,000 feet behind the ark of the covenant. That's about, in today's language, about 0.57 miles. That's a long ways behind. It wasn't just a little ways, like let them lead the way and then you follow. Now, I don't know all the reasons. Um, it could have been to protect them from getting zapped by touching the ark, if you remember the story in the Old Testament. Perhaps they would take the wrong path if they didn't wait. They'd get ahead of the ark and what God had. Maybe their idea to cross the Jordan River, how, how would you cross the Jordan River at flood stage? Would you tell the priest to get in a, take an ark and take a step in there and watch God part it? Or would you do like most of us would do? Well, I could probably build a boat. And we could just transport people back and forth. Or we could, maybe we could build a bridge. Or maybe we could canoe across. Or 
maybe we'll just wait a long time and set this out until the water gets a little bit lower, right? He said, I want you to wait and watch what will happen. I want you to stay far enough behind. Don't get ahead of what God wants to do for your life. How many of you here have ever tried to get ahead of God? You don't have to raise your hand. In a job, in a dating relationship, in a decision. Here's what I find out in my life, and I think you'll probably identify with this. If you get in a hurry and you get ahead of God, you just mess it up. Right? You, you, God knows better. Why do we think we should do it ourselves? The Bible and history are full of examples of people who have got ahead of it and they created a mess. How about instead of being a statistic like all those people who get ahead of it, how about instead we become a servant and we get, wait for God's timing and we say, you know what, okay, God, I'll stand back and I'll watch the presence of God in the ark and the leaders that you had get ahead of me and I will watch and I will follow. There's a good lesson in following the Lord there. And the last one he said is this, consecrate yourself. Joshua chapter 3, verse 5, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now, most of us today don't understand what the word consecrate means. Consecrate means simply to set apart as holy. It means things like making yourself clean or purifying yourself before God. For them, consecration involved oftentimes involved bathing. It's good for you to take a shower once in a while. Washing one's clothing and abstaining from some normal activities so that they were um, consecrated before the Lord. I'm going to give you a little history lesson as far as I know it. In, gestur- in generations past, part of the reason why people dressed up for church was that they were consecrating themselves before the Lord. They were showering on Saturday night or uh, or Sunday morning. They put their best clothes on because they wanted to consecrate themselves to the Lord. They wanted Him to get their best. Now, I'm not saying we all have to dress up. We can give God best in so many different ways. But there's something interesting about that idea. Sometimes God is saying, before I'm going to do amazing things, you need to first clean up your act, so to speak. You need to consecrate yourself. You need to get ready in your life and your spirit and all around you so that the next step that I am preparing before you, you are ready for. Let me ask you this question. This is a little personal. Do you need to do some purifying or consecrating before you go into your promised land? before you see the next God moment happen, the next miracle. And if you do, what do you need to be purified or consecrated from or to? You know, I can't answer that question for you. Here's what I believe. If there is an area that you need consecrated, maybe it's your entire life. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus. That's where it starts. Maybe it's something you're doing or not doing. I believe God will speak those things to you. By consecrating yourself, you're saying to God, I'm serious about the future that you have for me. You see, preparing for the future is doing all these steps so that when they get ready to cross the Jordan River, and many of you know the rest of the story, and I've alluded to it, God has begun to to do miracle after miracle. Here's what I believe. God is preparing some of us here today to say, Coming down the road here in 2024, I've got a lot of great opportunities to come in your way. I've got a lot of good things that I want to do in your life. I've got a lot of new, I've got miracles, I've got things that are going to happen. But you need to prepare yourself. You need to get up and move. You need to follow where you need to follow. You need to consecrate yourself. You need to obey. I believe God has great things in store in 2024. How many of you believe God has great things in store? Here's what, if you don't, then, then you need to start believing it because he does. So what we need to do is prepare for those great opportunities. Don't wait on 
Don't try to make it happen yourself. Wait for God. I'm telling you, there are going to be some awesome opportunities that God puts in front of you and in front of me this, this year in this church. I have an idea of some of them, but I have no idea what it looks like. I'm sure the children of Israel had no idea what it looked like, that they were going to have all the miracles take place. They may be as significant as the crossing of the Jordan River, but we have to prepare for them. So to be ready, ask yourself, in any of these four areas, do I need to work on them? Do you need to move out of where you are at emotionally, spiritually, physically? Do you need to prepare your mind for change or for something great? Secondly, do you need to follow somebody that you don't like or aren't sure if they know where they're going, but God is leading them ahead of you? Do you need to follow the Lord more? Thirdly, do you need to slow down and wait for God's timing? Ooh, that's a tough one. Are you getting too close and God says, slow down, you're getting ahead of me. I'm not there yet. Maybe God is telling you to get some space between you and something that is dangerous or he wants to protect you from. And the last one is maybe you need to consecrate yourself. Are, some thing, are there some things in your life you need to let go of that aren't pleasing to the Lord? Are there some areas that need to be set apart for the Lord's work? Let me give you some things to think about. Your finances, your time, your treasures, your relationships. Say, God, what are some areas I need to consecrate to you in 2024, starting right now? I wrote this last statement, and then I'm going to pray. It's time for all of us to start preparing ourselves for all of the great opportunities that God has for us in 2024. I don't want you to miss out, and I don't want to miss out. Would you bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, just as you prepared the people of Israel to get into their promised land, I believe you're preparing us. And God, I first want to pray if there's anyone here who spiritually have never prepared their heart to follow you. God, I ask you to speak to them right now and let them know that all they have to do is reach out to you. And you are more than willing to take them into your family. All they have to do, Lord, is admit that they're a sinner and know that you died on the cross for their sins and believe in faith that you will take that away. And they can trust you with their lives and they will be forever changed. That is the, great preparation, the greatest preparation any of us could have. And so, God, if there's somebody here today, I pray they would make that decision. And, God, for those who have made that decision, this is a walk that we take every day of our life. It's a faith walk to prepare for the future. But, God, as we walk into 2024, I pray you right now you would reveal any areas that need to be consecrated in people's lives. Whatever it is, maybe it's something that they are not doing. Maybe it's something that they need to do. Maybe it's something that's said. Maybe it's a hurt that needs to be left. Lord, maybe it's just waiting on your timing. God, whatever it is, I pray you speak now to each and every heart that we would know one area that we can do to prepare for the future in 2024. And then, God, we're going to look forward to what it is you have for us. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me? Here's what I want to encourage you to do. Here's what I wish you would do. If God has spoken to you about a specific area, I want you to not just think about it and walk out the door. I don't want you to just say it and walk out the door. I want you to find a way to remind yourself. Write it on a piece of paper. Stick it on a phone note that reminds you, that says, Lord, in 2024, here's what I'm going to do to consecrate myself. I am going to read my Bible every day. I am going to give up that thing that is keeping me back. I am going to wait for your timing, whatever that is. Don't just say, I'm going to do it, and then walk out the door. Find a way to remind yourself so that when you reach 
that point where you're ready to enter the promised land, you are completely and totally ready because you've walked into that preparation. Can you do that? Can you find a way? And if you're not sure what that is, ask your spouse, ask your friend, say, hey, can you remind me? Can you remind me about that? So, Lord, as we walk from this place, as we dismiss from this place, Lord, help us to walk in the victory that is found because we're consecrating ourselves. We're doing what you've asked us to do. We're walking in obedience. And, Lord, I believe when we begin to do that, we're going to see great and awesome things take place here in this church and in each and every life. I pray now in Jesus' name. And, Lord, help us to encourage one another to walk in those ways. Amen. Amen. Hey, when somebody leaves today, would you tell them you're glad to see them? Would you give them a hug or an encouraging high five or something? God bless you.